Good evening and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are uh, on the globe. And this, the topic of today and the entire e-conference of the World Academy of Art and Science and United Nations in Geneva is indeed global leadership and unleashing social processes for global social transformation. My name is Mila Popovic and I am the head of research and development of the same project and here today with my colleague and co-creator Julene Siddiq uh, who has gathered us here in, and convened this panel on uh, culture and, and its capacities and strategic um, leverage points for, tr for global transformation. The project, as I, as I mentioned, has been convened between these two international global organizations exactly to see the ways in which we can accelerate, scale up and scale out um, transformative strategies to take us forward into the new paradigm of human development. Earlier today, Julian and I led a panel on art impact and transformation, uh, showcasing a whole spectrum of artistic um, practices, communities and initiatives. And today and right now, we are starting out with a panel that is going to zoom out on larger cultural processes and indeed on focus on systemic change and structural intervention in the best way we can to set the, to set the stage for global transformation and to mobilize and activate that global social leadership. Julene, over to you. If Thank you very much, it. Mila. Thank you for that introduction. And definitely we are talking about, you know, why hasn't, why haven't these transformations taken place? And I think we've hit a very crucial crossroads um, for humanity that we're going to radically change or radically fail. And um, what we would like to bring forward, what I think the contextualized disciplines of um, anthropology, social sciences have brought forward is an understanding of larger pathologies of power. We know in global, um, global health, one of the largest detriments of social health, what create the social detriments of health um, is structural violence and how the risk of ill health is structured. We know from studies in um, human rights and social justice from big scholars like Thomas Podge talking about how the status quo perpetuates poverty in poor countries and that our reigning and economic politically systems actively cause harm to the poor by perpetuating an unfair status quo. And that the, he argues that the global institutional architecture as an active cause of harm. And what we're talking about now in this conference is what are the strategies, how have we misconceptualized the problem? And what are the strategies that are gonna bring about genuine social progress? Being one of the main things from the contextualized disciplines, pathologies of power and structural um, violence, which Peter Joseph has done an incredible job of understanding how to undertake a structural analysis and put forward structural solutions, which I think is the key piece that has been missing from this transformative work that is looking for genuine social progress. Um, he is the author of the New Human, uh, the New Human Rights Movement, Reinventing the Economy to End Depression. Um, and I'll hand it over to you. I won't take much more of its time. So thank you so much, Peter, for being here. Um, and with that um, introduction, I'm uh, very happy to he have you here and hear about your work. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be amongst people that share a, a similar intellectual view. This kind of thinking is rather obscure. I think most of you know it's out of the general public awareness. Uh, sociological thinking is still rather distant, as I'm going to talk about in a moment. So I want to thank you both, all of you, excuse me, once again. Um, I'm really excited and happy that if I, if I say things that seem a little obvious, it's because very often I speak to an audience that has none of this kind of background. And obviously there are people listening, uh, so that will hold true a little bit, but uh, allow me to begin. So I was invited here to talk about structuralism, which is a term coined in my work. So I'm gonna try and give uh, a general theory of this structuralism, highlighting key terms to start. I define structuralism as a methodology where characteristics of culture and society are understood in terms of relationships to larger order systems or structures. The term historically has been linked to the field of sociology, of course, sociology being the science of understanding why culture, institutions, and dominant human behaviors are what they are. 
However, in my research on sociological causality, which is really a fairly new perspective, as I said, going back to Max Weber in the mid 19th century, there's a general lack of integration with human biology. And you really can't develop a working general theory of societal behavior without taking into account the science of behavioral biology, especially now considering the revelations that have come forward. And while people today have debated the false duality between nature and nurture, uh, the science of behavioral biology has really given us great information about how our brains, hormones, neurochemicals respond to environmental conditioning, showing that synergy of the two. So just as we have institutional structures in our society, economic, legal, punitive, religious, to even dominant moral and philosophical structures about success, purpose, relationships, and so on, we can't discount the biological tendencies that intersect when thinking about causality. It's an important point. A true sociological science that seeks to generate a general theory of human behavioral causality, which is what we're really doing, must take into account not only the shared institutionalized structures we see, such as the economic system, but also the shared biological structures of the species, how our brains evolved and are wired to deal with things, particularly stress, conflict, deprivation, emotional loss, abuse, and so on. And that's what I mean more holistically by the term structuralism, which is very different from traditional historical definitions. And what I argue from this analysis involving both society and biology is that not, not only is society today structured in such a way that if left unchanged will result in catastrophic ecological failure, as I will touch upon, it also brings out the worst of human potential, creating a highly antisocial culture, one that values selfishness, authoritarianism, dominance, competition, materialism, group antagonism, and so on. It sort of overpowers our innate capacity to be compassionate, peaceful, empathic, cooperative, uh, all the values we tend to praise about the positive sides of our human variability. I'm sure we've all encountered the classic cynic when in debate about the range of human potential that concludes something like, oh, humans are just competitive and dominant. It's genetic, they say, uh, when they are in fact half correct, a dangerous, nefarious half correct. Uh, human nature, if you will, is many things at once and they contradict and we're no more competitive than we are collaborative. It's the social condition and the circumstance we find ourselves that decides which way we are going to be generally speaking. And that's the realization uh, with the question then becoming, what kind of society will bring out the best of our biological nature? Having institutional structures that can best ensure not only a reduction in human conflict, but also one that is actually in harmony with nature, allowing for long-term species survival. So yes, we do have evolutionary baggage. And I wanna bring this up because it's inevitably something that people, critics bring up that works against our ideal social psychology, that kind of lower brain fight or flight mode, hormones that mess with our judgment. There's even areas of the brain that have serious problems with things that look unfamiliar, such as people, generating potential in-group, out-group bias and bigotry. And we can't really change that per se. You could meditate and do all sorts of therapy and so on, but the fact is the strongest thing we can do is to change the external condition and attenuate those more primitive reactions. And the key word here is precondition. A precondition is defined, excuse me, <clears throat> a precondition is something required for something else to follow. It's a medical term and a sociological precondition, the sociological precondition we have today specifically due to our social structure is so out of date. It, it doesn't just bring out the worst of our biological nature, it commands it while at the same time is incentivizing almost the exact opposite, once again, of what is required for humanity to be sustainable in the long term. Hence, if you want to change the world for the better, you have to change the sociological precondition. And that means you have to change the structure of society, hence changing the most influential factor of that structure, how we survive, the economy. And that's my central focus and criticism. So with that introduction aside, let's get more specific as to how the social structure is creating, amplifying, and accelerating two of the most dangerous social problems we face today as a species, ecological decline and socioeconomic inequality. Let's start with ecological decline. Can we find anything in the structure of our economy that limits habitat sustainability? So much so that no matter how well-meaning a society may be, as long as they exist in that structure, the incentivized patterns inevitably ensure this lack of sustainability. Let's go back to the Neolithic revolution, the dawn of agriculture, perhaps the most relevant shift in human history. The structural change from nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes to settled agrarian societies cannot be understated in understanding how we got to where we are today. 
And the key systemic act in question here, something that is not talked about enough, is the act of competitive market trade. It may seem oversimplified, but competitive trade, trade itself as we know it, that act that we all engage throughout our lives as if it's just a natural thing to our condition, can be thought of as a kind of historical seed set in motion, the, setting in motion the framework of everything we see around us in modern society today. Now, I'm not going to go into too much on this in detail due to time, but the incentives that go into the single act of competitive trade extrapolate out to millions and then billions of people operating with the same incentives. And the central mechanism that has been built is the central, excuse me, that is the central mechanism that is, is defining characteristic of civilization on so many levels. Again, it's more expanded upon in the book. From the rise of nation states, armies, large scale warfare, corporations, class division, inequality, slavery, oppression, bigotry, and so on. Most everything you see around you comes from that seemingly insignificant act of mutual exchange between parties as a system of economy. I know that's a big statement, but I, uh, I can defend it wholeheartedly. In fact, you may notice that I'm not going to use the word capitalism much in this talk, as capitalism is an institutional concept. It's not the dynamic. Trade is the dynamic. Mass monetary-based trade with all the features of property, labor specialization, labor exploitation, and so on. This has created the capitalist order as we know it as a natural unfolding. Hence, no need for the word capitalism if you truly want to be causal in your analysis. And in this historical development exists a basic contradiction within the market economy, the market system, slowly coming to the surface over thousands of years. And that's a system that simply has no clue what to do when there is an economic surplus or abundance. In the Middle Ages, a shoemaker could maybe produce a few pairs of shoes by hand. Uh, today, an automated shoe factory can produce hundreds, if not thousands, every single day. Point being, in the past, our technological ability with industrial production was not advanced enough to create all the negative market externalities, such as resource overshoot, biodiversity loss, pollution. Only upon the Industrial Revolution and the ex exponential acceleration of, of production capacity did this emerge. And it's a fascinating development. We could have gone a different way, perhaps. You know, you preserve a conservative ethic in society upon the Industrial Revolution, you reduce the cost of goods, you adjust uh, wage levels, you get people to work less, and you just sort of reacclimate to the entire thing based upon less consumption. Well, no. Or we could even have solved poverty, in fact, at that point, because it was a relative concept. Poverty itself is a relative notion. Um, but anyway, we didn't do any of those things. Why? Because we were loyal to the market structure which has no variable for dealing with abundance. It can only understand scarcity because scarcity or deficiency creates demand and demand creates jobs. Without jobs, people can't earn money to spend back into the system, keeping the machine going. In other words, we live in a world where the economy actually requires, requires constant turnover of goods to work. Like the gas pedal on a car, consumption is the fuel that keeps it going. And long ago, it made sense that market behavior was rooted in this scarcity because back then, resource extraction, production was quite difficult. And it also made labor for income, the system of labor for income and specialization, it made sense uh, because people have to assume these roles. If scarcity is dominant, then labor will be in demand. So what happens when we're able to exceed current levels of consumption as we've had, as we have? Uh, I mean, this surplus that we generated since the Industrial Revolution. Charles Kettering, a very famous industrialist, uh, a famous automotive CEO, I apologize, I don't remember the company right now, but he wrote in a very famous magazine in the early 20th century that it was now the public's role to consume. And if America had expected to beat the communists and raise the standard of living, he explained candidly that we just have to keep buying new things, keep demanding buying, you know, throw away, buy, it literally is a complete uh, irrational state of, of, of habitat sustainability, insane really, when you think about it. But the logic was structurally related to the market economy. And he was right in terms of what actually happened. There's no market economy. The market can't handle surplus. Um, it doesn't support the system. If a company produces a product that can last, say, 100 years without maintenance, that company will be out of business after so many units are sold. So long story short, today we have an economy that literally compels consumption and the more the better, assisted by the powerful arm of advertising, which was born during that same period of time, uh, direct public manipulation from the West that traveled like a disease throughout the world, working to manipulate human psychology into buying things. And if you don't buy, once again, the system fails, as we see with the COVID-19 crisis with 42 million unemployed in America alone and a dramatic GDP drop, we see very candidly what happens when people are not consuming at the rates that they used to and the repercussions of that. 
So, so Peter, I'm just going to, we've got five Sorry. minutes. So I want you to go into some of the solutions that you're putting forward and just, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the, I'll just summarize briefly then before I get to that. Uh, the other issue with socioeconomic inequality, a great deal could be said about the toxicness that creates unequal societies are dramatically more unhealthy. Um, and it's the, that inequality is generated by two fundamental factors. The gaming strategy that is involved in market behavior, which always gives advantage to those with the most money and resources and a positive feedback loop. And also the debt system and the way money is created, all money is made out of debt. There's more money in it, more debt, excuse me, in existence than money. $220 trillion in debt today with only about 85 trillion in currency. That is a direct imposition upon the lower class. Now, yeah. let's move to solutions. If you would like to bring up figure 5C, if that's possible for the viewing audience, uh, that's the best uh, thing to look at for this. Figure 5C, I'm going to state this. I'm not sure if it's brought up. Is it brought up? Okay, Mila, did you have that figure 5C or, or Vani? Vani, do you have the figure? I can find it. She's yeah. ready. I will. Uh, the, I will. No, 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 that's not the figure. There was another. There was another one that was put up in in the email. Peter, you can keep. Uh, uh, if you want to keep. I it will Robert find it. Okay. Yeah, okay. let me find I'll, it. I'll keep going, and if you if you can put it up, that's great. So um, I'm going to speak about uh, five different transitions that, if achieved, would assist in ensuring sustainability, reducing scarcity pressure in society, and reduce caustic socioeconomic inequality. The first is automation. As I've touched upon, automation is an emerging contradiction due to the pursuit of cost efficiency, cost savings on the part of the producer. And at some point, it's going to become cheaper to automate than to use human labor breaking the link between labor and income as a universal. Yes. Rather than wait for this to happen, it would be smart to start delinking now yeah. uh, using yeah. universal basic income as a bridge. It's just gonna get more and more hectic if we don't. It also is more efficient and lots of other things that I won't go into detail with. The second idea of transition is access as opposed to property. Jeremy Rifkin, a notable futurist, wrote a great text years ago talking about how much more efficient it would be to live in a kind of rental society, for lack of a better expression, uh, where automated systems or, or just basically shared systems uh, replace property. And there's enormously good arguments um, towards why that should be the case. Ownership is a very wasteful process um, as compared to as compared to an access system. Eventually you're gonna have something like automated car systems and people are not gonna be driving as much. That's the beginning seed of this. And by the way, everything I'm talking about in terms of solutions is already happening. It's just not happening with the same concentration and needed effect to really make social change. But it is a natural gravitation. An access society will also change our incentives too, which is a very big point. Third attribute for the sake of time, I'm gonna go quickly here, has to do with open source contribution making all industrial and scientific information freely available. This could be deemed a cultivation of what uh, some have called a collaborative commons. Uh, the market economy treats ideas as property, as we know, to be bought and sold, and uses the term intellectual property as if by which a large host of laws exist. The market incentivizes the proprietary hoarding of information and closed internal development rather than open collaborative development, which is far more robust and efficient, provably so. And while it makes sense in this kind of economy to have that, that's not the way the real world should operate, as I think we might all agree. Uh, we're constantly duplicating things. Companies are competing against each other for different improvements. There's, uh, there's this general waste. If simply the information was shared, the efficiency and development innovation could happen in a unified way without the need for wasteful and destructive competition. The fourth issue has to do with localization. In stark contrast to globalization, localization is about regaining efficiency and reducing waste by locally producing as much as possible. We shouldn't be importing strawberries thousands of miles in the United States from Brazil. It's just preposterous that we're wasting energy and time and resources on such a thing when we could easily localize, especially with modern methods. So there's lots to be said on that as well. And the final issue I'd like to say has to do with networked digital feedback. It's a little more of an esoteric concept, but we've all heard of the internet of things. And while it doesn't have an exact definition, it's about networking technology sensors to optimize information flows. And that's what basically money and markets claim to do the most efficiently, at least in the past. Uh, Ludwig von Mises in his work, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, a very famous anti-socialist text uh, argues that it would be impossible without trade, money and markets for people to be able to accomplish the information required to efficiently have economies work. And that is absolutely debunked in the modern day with modern methods. 
lots I can say. I think I've hit my 15 minute mark. I'm gonna stop there due to time, but if you wanna read more about these ideas in detail, you can check out the book, The New Human Rights Movement. And I thank you. Now, Peter, we thank you. We appreciate how incredibly challenging it must be to summarize all that content. So um, thank you very much. Um, what we're talking about in this, uh, you know, for real transformation to occur and acknowledging the baggage, acknowledging something which I refer to as systemic incentivization, right? So realizing that institutions are not just, you know, some part of society that we go to or choose not to go to, they're institutionalizing psychology. And there's good work now on understanding how institutions affect behavior, how behavior changes with when inside different contexts. And so, you know, this is profoundly important because we're talking about how can we really, really get, you know, the, this transformation to happen. Um, and I know it's something you talked about in your book that the majority of activism has not been structural, right? And there is a yeah. lack of this critical structural awareness, a lack of being able to make these critical connection between the, you know, like the field of biology and, and sociology for the everyday person. So um, one of the people that I've brought to this panel is um, an incredible woman, um, Margaret Ludwith, and we're going to all discuss around these issues. Um, she has an incredible practice of community development, um, which teaches this critical consciousness. It's based on the work of Paulo Ferrer, um, who, who di did liberation theory back in the 70s. Um, but I'd just like to introduce, Margaret has a, um, is gonna be introducing this practice of, of critical community development that enables the generative form of knowledge, critical connections and thinking that I think is an important culture-based localized practice, which enables the everyday people to become leaders. And that's, that's, that's what the kind of catalyzation we're looking for. Leaders don't create followers, they create more leaders. So with that little bridge, I'd like to hand it over to Margaret to talk about her work. Right, thank you, Julene. Um, I'm Margaret Ledwith, as you've just heard. Um, my background's community development, as you've just heard, but what you don't know is that I come with a profound commitment to social justice and environmental justice as a consequence of working many years of my life in marginalized communities in the northwest of England and Scotland and traveling elsewhere. But um, I guess my emphasis in this introduction is that um, it, it's not the heady titles of professor, but it's the teaching that I've had about the dehumanizing impact of poverty that's come from sharing my life and work with people who are living it out. So uh, my first provocation, as Julian will love, is poverty is a political decision, it's a choice, um, but it's also a violation of human rights. So I'm going to talk to this, um, I'm addressing the contradiction here, that we have the ideas to end world poverty overnight, but not the collective will. And to that end, I'm going to introduce you to a collective practice for catalyzing transformative change. So to understand resistance to change, we need to understand that discrimination is intersectional. It's not only intersectional, but it's sewn into the structures of society on a global level. And I say this just briefly because neoliberalism hit us, but then it went global and it took its value base with it. So now we're talking about change needing to reach globally because nation states can't make a difference. Um, we need a paradigm shift. And I want to emphasize that values form the basis of change. Founding society, for instance, on competition, and Peter's talked about a, a lot about this, leads inevitably to inequality because it's based on values of exploitation and marginalization and privileging the already privileged. Whereas if we take a shift on this um, and found society on cooperation, it has a different value set based around it and it inevitably would lead to greater equality. So how do we bridge the gap? Into Paulo Freire to start with the Brazilian adult educator, for those of you who may not know. He transformed uh, community development 
from an ameliorative practice. And by this, I mean one that focuses on the surface symptoms of inequality and oppression into a critical practice with the power to bring about radical social change. Freire offers a complete process. It starts in critical consciousness in local communities, but it follows through to transformative collective action for global change. So I'm honing in here on where the weak spots might be. The process starts, and this is essential, with a profound belief that everyone has the human right to dignity and respect, and that people are capable of thought and action needed to change their world. Freire named cultural invasion as the process that kills and reduces subordinated cultures under the weight of this dominance. So at this point, let me introduce you to how a critical radical community development praxis might work. The critical educator, you might know this term as a popular educator, animateur, works with values of cooperation. And I have in mind here, mutuality, reciprocity, respect, dignity, trust, and they form a lens around every stage of that process. That lens provides checks and balances. So if you go off piece at any point, you have something that corrects you. The critical educator listens from the heart, not from the ears, but from the heart, to the stories people tell about their lived reality. It's not a form of education that tells people what to think. It's a liberating education. Listening to stories leads to identifying generative themes, and by this Freire meant the common experiences that emerge from these stories. And then, using a problematizing approach, generative themes are decontextualized from the taken for grantedness of everyday life. And by this, I mean, we see in humanities acted out everywhere we go in life, but they're so normalized that we don't recognize the contradictions we're living through. So if we decontextualize those atrocities, it makes it much easier to see the unacceptable contradictions we live by more critically. We capture these in codifications, and by this, um, other ways of knowing, stories, drawings, music, poetry, drama. All of these can capture experiences, but the process of decoding happens in mutual horizontal dialogue just by questioning life experience, going deeper into making critical connections, simply by asking, what's going on here? Where is it? Who's involved? Why is that happening? How are they affected? These are prompts, these are educators prompting critical questions, not telling people how to think. Conscientization, as, as Freire called the process of becoming critical, is rooted in reciprocal relations. And I emphasize these terms because they're horizontal terms. And I rather see the top downness of competition pulled on its side in cooperative horizontal relations. Um, the process is the critical educator, not as a teacher of people, telling people how to think, but as a teacher and learner. And the learner is also a learner and teacher. And this is what I mean by those reciprocal relations. The teacher is open to learn as much as he or she is open to teach. Always questioning, never dictating answers or telling people how to think. This is the context for autonomous thinking. As I said, a process of liberating education. Questioning deepens critical consciousness. And by this, I mean we go from the contradictions of everyday life to identify how these are embedded in structural discrimination. This is the basis for transformative action for change. In these critical spaces, a counter-narrative is created. 
We simply cannot change anything on critique alone. We need another story, a compelling story, to put in its place. What kind of world do we live in? Why is it like that? What kind of world do we want? And how do we get there from here? This process moves outwards, connecting with other networks and alliances into a movement for change. My unequivocal point, without critical consciousness, there will be no radical transformative action. Critical consciousness in action is the driver of transformative practice. Bridging the gap is the focal point here. Paula Ferrari, five minutes, uh, right, right, right. Um, Paula Freire was clear that local conscientization has to happen in order to reach for global action, otherwise no transformative change. Um, I'm now going to say I was lucky enough very quickly to be in Nicaragua in 1986 and see Freire in action, transforming literacy levels and health outcomes and I also want to quickly mention the Adult Learning Project in Edinburgh, uh, which was central to the movement for change that resulted in a Scottish Parliament in 1998. So in summary, Freire must be a complete process. It must not be piecemeal or fragmented. It must critically engage with intersectionality, the overlapping interconnected nature of oppressions and reach into the structures of society or it will fail. Now, I just want to quickly, in the remaining three and a half minutes, um, to say, based on this Frarian Foundation, I've got a seven-step model to a transformative agenda, taking critical consciousness to radical transformation. And I'm going to zip through these fairly quickly. Um, step one, voicing values, the bedrock of change. What are the values we would like to live by? Step two, Making critical connections. This enables us to identify the unacceptable contradictions that have been normalized by poverty stigma. Since when did food banks become normal in rich countries, I ask you? <laughs> Step three, critique and dissent. These are deepened through dialogue and this process engages with dominant ideology. It's sold as common sense. There is no alternative, no alternative to a system that's failed us. Rich people need to get richer, poor people are welfare scroungers, let's build walls. And we shine a light in this process on white privilege, colonialism, slavery, racism, patriarchy. Step four, imagining alternatives. We've had a total failure of political imagination. And I'm pointing towards here, people emerging like Kate Raworth's donut model of a new economy with people and planet at its heart to universal basic income. We could do things differently. Imagine everyone paying fair taxes and no tax havens. Imagine no child going hungry. Imagine every child having the best education possible. Imagine welcoming immigrants. Imagine saying no to rule by market forces and profit growth. And imagine saying yes to a kinder, non-competitive way of making a market serve happy people and a healthy planet. Step five, creative counter-narratives. I'm feeling that I'm going to be excommunicated any minute. Um, okay, we need to put something in the place of this politics of hatred, a politics with love at its heart. And that starts in values. Step six, connecting and acting in movements for change. Changing the way we see the world changes the way we act the world. We are witnessing people rising, Black Lives Matter, hashtag Me Too, Occupy, Extinction Rebellion. Step seven, cooperating for a common good. Once we expose the discriminating structures of dominant white Western patriarchal society, we see a way forward with new ideas. For example, the knowledge democracy movement calls for fund fundamental changes in knowledge. So 
schools and universities need to offer more inclusive ways of knowing that are not subordinated under the weight of power. I could go on at great length, but I'm going to say we stand at crossroads in time, an epoch in world history, an opportunity to change the course of history. I've stopped. <laughs> That was a lot Thank you so much, <laughs> An incredible Thank you. summary. I mean, such a simple practice, but it is really so powerful um, in combating all these fundamental psychological keys that are holding down really the, the really radical forms of social movement and social change and behavioral change that we're talking about. And I think um, that seven step agenda with making the critiques. Um, imagining alternatives is really important because that is a huge psychological factor saying that there's no other way or or other ideologies are you know demonized whatever so this is really important and also culture has not been on the agenda in terms of development development has been very quantitative um, for most part of its history top-down and actually working with local knowledge and going from local to global and having that ownership of learning experience rather than this propagative model of you know even when propagating something positive that actually we need when people generate that knowledge for themselves and have that ownership of learning experience yeah. that is a big empowering thing and mm. that is where we're going to have i think transformative leadership born mm. um, but just tying back into um the larger framework the socio-systemic framework is about both Right? It's about the social path that Margaret is um, really talking about with these community practice um, and this values believing in people to change it. It's about the systemic half. And they're intertwined. They're really interconnected, which is why it's one framework. The systemic half is the larger structure that if we don't change these, we will not get genuine social progress. In order to change structural change, you have to work with people in order to believe and invent these new systems. But one area um, which I want to take development out of the NGO third sector and realize that there's more than one way to act on, um, on, on these socio-systemic phenomenon, and that is innovation. Um, Gita Payan um, and, her, and her husband, Ralph Payan, have created an incredible technology. There's a lot of very deep science behind it. I'm sorry I'm squeezing all of you to sum things up so quickly. <laughs> I, I, well, we should get some place to expand later on. Um, but this is an incredible thing because she's talking about changing the very nature of the way media is designed. And we know from critical studies in media, media the role of the manufacture of consent, propagation of dominant narratives and not you know acknowledging other ways of thinking other you know other narratives other forms of intelligence and the role that that plays so i want to bring it over to gita to talk about this really game changing innovation that she has to act, a systemic innovation acting very systemically on um, the very nature of what media is and how social knowledge systems work and what that kind of systemic innovation can do to act structurally, socially, and really change the game. So handing it over to Gita. Um, first, I want to thank WAAS and UN for making this important conference happen. And many thanks to you, Jolene, for inviting me to this panel. Um, the evolution of mankind is an evolution of sign processing. Every time we humans are confronted with emergence, like from urbanization to industrialization, and now from digital industrialization to what I call reality emulation, where our daily life for the first time becomes characterized by us emulating our realities in synergy with machines, our way to process languages change. New concepts rise and societies are fundamentally shaken. Today we face not only such an emergence and it overloads individuals, teams, families, organizations, whole societies with complexity, but also a meta crisis that can, as we all know, lead to our downfall. Climate change and pandemics call for action and people are not yet economically, mentally and emotionally properly prepared for the challenges coming with them. 
I want to talk to you about what Formwelt and Formwelt Online can do for intersectionality or even better functional structural coupling and collective intelligence by helping the individual groups, teams and so on to develop cognitive and communicative emancipation. We need strong individuals, free from the urge to follow ideological impulses and populist rhetoric, emancipated in their own semiospheres to stop polarization in communicative giant waves, which are undermining our attempts to deal functionally with all the challenges and ordeals coming with the meta crisis we face. The solution is to strengthen the capabilities of the individual to conceptualize and to comprehend its existence in its world, to help the single human being to bring transparency into her thinking and thereby enable us to cooperate without hindrance in our actions that intend to form a livable and better future. The tool to realize this solution is formed. Um, Formwelt is a semantically and formally self-sufficient linguistic system, a universal language, a coding language for languages and meaning, which can be spoken by man and machine. It comes with a platform. The scientific and organizational support is growing and the construction has already begun. Its applications are vast and um, according to the need for solutions that work in all subsystems of society, education, science and citizen science, uh, communication, self-development, language-based behavior analysis, AI and robotics, longevity, equity, business arts and so on. Um, a form that works like Lego for concepts. You can use the language to gain and build your own terms from sensual perception and then present them to others in deep. It is an empirical and systemic approach, integrating fundamental concepts of system theory, constructivism, model theory, theory of science, logic and mathematics. And it is so easy to learn and work with that everyone, adults or children, people with challenges, everyone will have fun with it. While digging into formal concepts, people learn to think systemically, effortlessly, while searching for their own meaning. How does, does this or that concept works for me? How does it function? It leads to people reverencing their own minds and thus emancipating themselves in their own semiosphere. It helps with clarity of thought and communication. What we can think clearly, we can do clearly. Since Formel is a coding language, it has a mathematical foundation. AI can learn it and it can be translated into any language without loss of meaning along the way. Everyone can clearly reference his or her ideas of anything, map their minds, curricula, team concepts, cultural ideas and knowledge, and then present it to others for them to follow in deep. What you build in your mind is yours. Definitions do not belong to those who study them. They are out there, maybe in encyclopedias. Format references are constructed in your own mind. You build them from inside. Yeah, you build them from inside. I have a problem bringing through people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it is a coding language, but spoken in natural language like I do. Most of the words I use are constructed in form bed. You understand me quite well, but I know almost every sign I use by heart. They are mine and with the help of form bed. Online, we can exchange our reference perspectives and I can help you to dig into my concepts. That's making us each other transparent, transparent so far as we wish. Now you can rebuild my concepts within yourself and they can become yours too if you want to. Uh, what we need are people talking to each other on equal terms while thinking globally and systemically. People who know themselves, who know who they are and what they are talking about. 
We need a living language that helps us to see and eradicate conscious and subconscious discrimination in language as the building bricks of society. We need collective intelligence without ideology, with people who are very conscious about their own concepts, who can, oops, there's something missing, um, who can use this only universal language which is spoken in all languages of the world and are even capable to create new languages from emergence concepts in all senses, even synesthetical ones. Indirect and structural discrimination and polarization in the communicative giant waves, outdated operating systems in most dominating global organizations, politics with language that polarizes us all is robbing us of the power to address the pressing problems functionally. It is, most, it is mostly not intentionally done, but structurally implemented in our societies via conditioning and through language. A structural systemic problems need uh, solutions that work systemically while people living a systemic society in synergy with nature and the needs of the planet that can support human life. Language is the key to both the human mind and to society. It connects us, but it divides us at the same time. Building a linguistic and semiotic system that can do both helping the individual to express his or her individuality with utmost clarity on one hand, while on the other making any concept accessible and full to everybody else was, was our goal 30 years ago. Uh, back then we understood that if we want to help society to deal with the coming meta crisis, we have to build something that can bring people in utmost clarity together without bringing them in line. In meta crisis functioning, collective intelligence is dependent on individuals conscious of themselves. Otherwise, they will perish in ideologies. Racism, misogyny, minutes, minutes. hostility to minorities, predator capitalism are the result of ideological approaches on solving societal problems. And they are often hidden in languages in a way that the concerned people do not even recognize themselves as racist, misogynist, and so on. But the moment people start to work on their own concepts, clarify them and with them themselves. Aristical rhetoric will not work so good any longer. People can finally learn to see them, to see through semantics. They can cognitively slow down, calm their emotions and start to analyze what is in them and in front of them. Today, the dominating language in media and social media is linear, polarizing and emotional. People and nations overloaded with complexity with no functioning systemic language turn to isolationism, nationalism, extremism, goading each other deeper and deeper into symmetrical contravalent conflicts while trying to deal with systemic polyvalent and complex problems and challenges. To be clear, we will not try to rescue the fanatic but give the people who want to live a free life a chance to recognize when they are under the demagogue's influence and following their advice, destroy their own future. Outdated education systems spoon feed children and adults, adults with suppressing the natural learning abilities, which actually are systemically and logically. Children think in multiple dimensions and kinesthetic kinesthetically. When they build their building brick towers and learn to ride a bike, they think systemically, logically, they use all their senses and they love to be challenged and to challenge themselves. But the moment they go to kindergarten, they are confronted with a world that thinks linear, that conditions into status hierarchies of all sorts and kinds. They unlearn how to learn freely and in a self-challenging way and then learn to fear to learn. And this is how, what we have to change in order to change the world. Climate change as man-made meta crisis is the result of exorbitantly uh, growing, confused and unnecessary communication and product of the actions of people who have unlearned to think systemically. And racism, predator capitalism and nationalism are constructs of people who cannot see what we depend on all of us, that we depend on all of us to survive. Okay, I quit here. I timed my uh, text prior to this to 30 minutes, but I think uh, my timer was wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Geet. I'll, I'll, uh, for everyone, I, you know, I appreciate everyone's efforts to really try to sum up some very complex concepts. Words make our world. And uh, in short, Gita has done an incredible study on that and how words are manipulated, you know, and how that affects us. 
then in reimagining alternatives, what if we have media that instead of dumbing us down makes us smart, that instead of polarizing concepts is able to bring people together. So that in short, I think is a very revolutionary thing um, that, that she's doing. It's a, it's a very deep innovation and it's a very systemic um, innovation, um, which I think can change the face of media. It's very complex. So thank you for, for simplifying it in that, uh, summarizing it in that short space of time. Um, I think what, if I could just sum up, I'd like to just do one quick summary and then we'll go to questions. Um, so Mila, if you can pull up the socio-systemic uh, strategy page. Or if, or Vani, if sorry. If you don't mind, Jalini, if you can hear me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jalini, can you hear me? Don't mind. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we yeah. have some questions and some comments, but we also yeah. we okay, also have a surprise. This. We also have a surprise visitor uh, that I I wanted to share with you that could really actually provide um, a great context and great summary and another pathway or a kind of make a contribution to this discussion in a very brief way. And I would like to also invite you, Julie to share some of your practice. And I would add a note by myself before we uh, open up the conversation, because I'm getting a sense that what is going to be shared in addition uh, might actually answer some questions. And then we can invite things. I would like to introduce quickly, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and sharing your video, Jerry Glenn, who is the co-founder and leader of the Millennium Project, an extraordinary Wonderful. international organization with 66 national nodes all over the world. It's a think tank and a renowned think tank that has been around for more 25 years. Um, and uh, a, a think tank of futurists uh, for foresight, for global foresight, global systemic intelligence that we're sharing. Jerry can tell you a little bit. be a proud member of the network and Jerry is a dear friend and co-creator. So I will introduce you by calling on an idea of yours, Jerry, that is the self-actualizing economy. So uh -huh. if you would like to share that with us and just say hello to the panel, we have a, just a surprise guest and I'm thrilled to be able to bring him in. Uh, boy, there's just so much to say and I've got to do it in a couple of seconds here. One, uh, just before the self-actualizing economy concept, is a building on the business about the prejudice. Uh, I tried to find out the previous speaker was speaking in a sense a lot about how to address prejudice in our civilization. I tried to find the largest prejudice I could find and uh, at all time and all cultures. And it, and it looked to me like it was prejudice between the, the tool maker and the consciousness sharer. Sort of the mystic, the technocrat. And it doesn't matter whether they're right wing, left wing, up wing, down wing, Africa, Asia, it's everywhere. You know, we're gonna solve the problem by sharing consciousness. No, 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 we're gonna solve the problem by a rule or a, or a technology. Well, we could do both. Um, it seems to me if we can get the mystic in ourselves and in civilization and the technocrat in ourself and in civilization to sort of like have a little harmony so that we draw on the knowledge of the technocrat, but the attitude toward that knowledge of the mystic. Uh, in the same way, the great piano performance, the performer will often say, well, it was the music, it was my hands, it was the piano, it was all this together into a great performance. And as that consciousness and technology as a continuum uh, that uh, made the performance great. So imagine that metaphor going out to the future civilization. We're micro miniaturizing technology. We're putting it in and on our bodies. We're offloading our consciousness for better or for worse in different ways and artificial intelligence. So the, the relationship of the mind and machine is constantly blurring. Uh, and that has the advantage of putting the mystic and technocrat in direct conversation more in the future than it has been in the past. And I think that's a strategy to help reduce prejudice and a way forward. Uh, now on the, the um, Self-actualization economy, the idea there, th these are detailed scenarios that I can send reference to some other day. But the idea is that as you take labor out of the production uh, process to a large degree, 
your prices come down. Uh, the sp previous speaker mentioned about Rifkin. He's explained a lot of this quite well. So as a result, you're slowly separating money uh, from work and not job, but work. Like our, my work may be to help future thinking. A job might be doing a scenario for the Red Cross for the pandemic, okay? So the idea is that, is that we may be able to actually make a living out of being ourself. If the, if the basic necessities of civilization are being taken care of, which they are better than people realize, as, as that progress continues, and if the hierarchy of Maslow is correct, then as an individual goes through that, so too a civilization goes through that. And economics can go through that. Our basic needs, we had the agricultural age, then the industrial, you know, we go through all that so that the next evolution of economics could simply be self-actualization. You make a living out of being who you are. So your gift is unique. I cannot compete with you being you. I, you know, and why would I do that? I'd, I'd rather be me than my, you know, I, I'm, only, I'm really good at being me. I know how to do that. Now, if I can, in the past, you couldn't connect to the whole world to make a living. Now, by being yourself, connecting to, to much of the world, you only need 0.000001% to have a fairly good living. Um, there's a lot of detail in this, but I, I didn't expect to be here today. I was just sort of like kibitzing in the back, background. Gary. Yeah. If you don't mind, I am going to quote you from uh -oh. a very powerful speech in Korea. And uh, Jerry has this wonderful, humorous, but profoundly um, disruptive way of painting a picture of the future for us and reversing the value models and the socioeconomic models for us. Um, Jerry, as I'm just going to speak on behalf of your projects and the values that we share and, and, and you know, all the studies with, that we've shared. Um, Jerry, as he has announced earlier, is here for profound uh, shift of consciousness that in fact, technology support because technology is just a tool. All it's used depends on the consciousness behind it that programs it and uses it. So discussing at one point at a very big and important conference in Korea, and Koreans love all future making and anything about futures, he painted this powerful picture about technology and told them at the end as a punchline that simply in the future, um, if you are born, you're going to be poor, which I think has a <laughs> profound implication for all discussion about art and culture. And I'll say it again, in the future, if you're boring, you will be poor. So that's how the human and the individual uh, as a creator, as a sovereign being with that human dignity of whatever it spoke, with that uniqueness that Gita spoke in the so socioeconomic context that needs to be transformed of which Peter spoke, is going to be a self-generating, um, uh, powerful sovereign being that with the technology being shared, can actually uh, make a profound contribution and needs to be empowered to do so. And I don't use the word empowerment glibly here as, as that has been used. One of the technologies in which technocrats and visionaries and mystics are connected, in which art and science is connected, in which inner technologies are correlated with a larger social field, uh, should I say, with it, within the greater social fabric that vibrates a certain way, has always been music that is a whole brain engagement. And I am proud to, and, and a cultural meme that is fastest spread. We have so many historical examples. I would like to call on my co-chair, which did not necessarily plan to do this, but I really think it's important that she shares a bit about her practice that she's building and already um, spreading. And then I'll share a couple of words to actually uh, bring in the questions. I've been reading them and I invite the panel to read the questions in Q&A to kind of prepare for answering. And I'll also uh, look with you in the chat column just to see how we can en engage very patient um, audience. But let us speak about that correlation between inner and outer individual aesthetic states with external state, which I think uh, Julene represents a, a very interesting technology 
and can give us, um, tell us about, and I'll be sharing her website. T can uh, speak I, of her practice. I think Julie, gonna, we're going to go overboard. So um, thank you, everybody, for skipping overboard. I, it was Just probably give us a brief board. snippet, and I'll show them. Um, right. So um, we're t on the note of systemic innovation and changing systemic incentive, right? I think this is also what Jerry's getting at, you know, the mystic and the technocrat. Technocrat. Um, this is basically, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a composer and musician as well, and I noticed how, you know, anything really creative gets thrown out the window, and our previous panel was all about the role of art, the uses of art in social movements, in health, um, you know, t in transformation, this, this whole arena, which is completely underutilized or not even really uh, even known about in the music industry. So one of the tactics I look at for transformative change is how can we take the existing structures and change the systemic incentivization and create a big, you know, catalytic shift, which is what this is about. And I call it musical nutrition. So basically in the, in the 90s, the FDA released labels on food, you know, which told us what was inside food. You know, it tells us that, you know, the, the different nutrients. And what musical nutrition is, is it does that for music, right? So we can say, for example, there's a big science behind this with sound analysis and everything, but we're not gonna get to that. We can say, um, you know, do you realize there's a million people that are listening to music in, in this way and benefiting for these reasons? So they can get something new written or use something in their back catalog that has that. It's designed for benefit-based music distribution. It's designed for mood-based music distribution. It is designed um, in the company structure for human capital, social capital, natural capital. Therefore, alternative uses of music for, um, for the environment, for social change. We are hardwired for benefit. And I initially went into this from a health perspective, you know, a, a music and health uh, cross industry. And I was staring at my company paperwork, you know, and all my KPIs and, you know, measurement is all financial. And I said, I'm, I'm being systemically incentivized to work against the very thing I'm trying to do. Um, and that's when I, when, you know, got involved in the, in the future, in the future capital and the human capital, social capital, natural capital. Um, so changing the model for music to, for the music industry to enable not only benefit distribution, but to catalyze, just unlock the use of music for social change and all the things we talked about um, in the previous um, panel. So the point is here is what, you know, what can be done, you know, in a similar practice, you know, like, like Margaret was saying, building these critical practices you know, um, and, and building the use of music for health and optimizing the human. I think this is also what Gita is looking at, is how do we use um, technology to optimize the human rather than the other way around. So I don't want to go too far um, into my um, work, but, but, but it, it's possible also to create systemic innovations that change the incentivization, change the values, change the... Um, the behavioral incentives and that actually you know what i say to people is the the hierarchy of knowledge doesn't mean other knowledge doesn't exist it's just that propagated hierarchy there is a wide variety of musicians doing tremendous things to to change communities but they're just unknown because we have a propagated um hierarchy so um i want to just bring it back now i don't know if we want to do the systemic summary now um and then we'll take questions afterwards we will give we will give this a, a, just a little bit of a breather because I feel how empowered actually and energized the audience is. So I will bring an, another kind of summative slide for everybody that Lean prepared on the question of culture and transformation. Um, I will actually address a little bit of a questions here just to start and I'll do around the panel uh, on some of these questions. Uh, first of all, Jolene, thank you for pointing out to all of you in the panel and especially now uh, you highlighted Jolene, something that I have always been focusing in my own practice and program of evolving leadership, a transformational practice for, you know, individuals and organizations and kind of planetary scope, uh, that, that the fact that 
the finer the medium, the greater its capacity for energy and power transmission. We're talking electricity, we're talking social energy uh, uh, agency, we're talking uh, uh, um, f fen phenomena, natural phenomena, material phenomena, as well as transcendental capacities, as well as social uh, leadership. So once again, the finer the medium, the, the, the greater its capacity for energy and power transmission. This is the key link, connective link between what you're saying, Julian, and what, you know, you take us back to what Peter was saying. He, Peter is talking about a social field and social fabric that's saturated in a calculated way with certain values of which Margaret spoke. And culture is a, is a living economy of values. To also address some of the comments in the chat, to speak that we should dispense of money, it's somewhat um, far-fetched because I think as humans that are world builders and culture makers, we need currencies. We need medium for exchanging of values and communication. If money wasn't there in one form or another, we would invent it. It's a language. And it was a language invented uh, to, for exchange of values that's supposed to be fair, that's supposed to be serve and benefit humanity. The fact that our consciousness twisted that, it's a whole other story. But the money can go from 12 men under uh, a tree that agreed to cr create a stock exchange. That's exactly what happened. And tar started trading in sticks or we had golden uh, bars, then we moved to paper, and now we're, some of us are scared that it's gonna go digital encoding. Yes, that's what life is. It's encoded with information. We are just, again, to go back the finer the medium. We are more and more moving to ethereal means of exchange, where greater and more important function and significance is going to be a finer means of communication education, economic relating, and economic exchange. So this is exceptionally important to point out that, in fact, I should probably share this as, as kind of a way of um, bringing this up for you and tying it back into the project, that what we have here in this project is, in fact, uh, um, I'll be just brief, we're looking for socio-systemic framework that highlights and showcases phenomena that are initiating and guiding as evolution of those social norms, as well as new developmental direction and new trajectory, and also showing the steps of how to get there. And I think every single one of you did that. Examples could be coming from these different domains. What we have seen is a direct causal link between neglect of art and culture and kind of either misdirected or stunted social development of growth or perverted <laughs> growth is a overgrowth of some kind or another, which is, you know, not good economic well-being or uh, global health well-being. So what we have seen of methodologies of how to stunt that and how to demotivate culture or defund culture and arts is by way of exhausting, suppressing, neglecting, lack of funding and support, but also appropriation because the forces that have their vested in interests are definitely using culture to spread different kind of values that, that also propone more disparity. The roles of culture and art, I am just listing them here so they can be recorded for later, but Julian and I have spent a couple of years now talking about the fact that we have all these different sectors, including in our own uh, Global Leadership Project, different sectors. We're trying to use analytical thinking to actually organize the project and organize our participation in it. 15 sectors, cross-sectoral things, different um, domains of human activity, where in fact, it's art and culture that could serve as this integrative math method integrative pathway and a true interface between these domains for greater culture shift. So what we're looking for is, you know, um, aesthetic uh, uh, states and state of affairs and modes of organizing and self-organizing this global transformation, that there are correlating aesthetic and political representation. We have seen before a rise of culture movements and, and birth of participation in power, which is exactly where we are today in the current historical moment. But what we are working towards is cultural co-creation and partnership. And 
these are just some of the questions. What is the new human story for which uh, uh, Margaret called us to, uh, all of us actually. And then finally, what are the new catalytic strategies for social transformation? That is the question that I would like to ask at the end. What in the project and amongst ourselves we are searching for and uh, putting accent on is this the social process of social learning that is unprecedentedly global right now, especially within the conditions of um, viruses and uh, protests and people showing up together and showing up for universal values, showing up for each other and their communities right now in the street as we speak. Of course, global social leadership is the social process of global transformation and of course, building of the new social architecture. So I am giving a summation and, and uh, uh, Julene will go another round and I would like to really address the questions that are here uh, as we are looking at the questions uh, in the uh, chat box, uh, there was a question for Peter Joseph, and we'll do another round, start from you, Peter. If you look at here, it says, um, how do you respond to people who strongly believe that it's just a matter of who or which political candidate is in the office in order to make policy changes and apply regulations? Uh, we're also talking about concept clarity that is fundamental here. For instance, when people say we need system change, they very use very ambiguous concept. We need concrete strate uh, uh, transformative strategies and practices. How do we change media from sensational, sensationalizing? Uh, in, uh, and of course, another Peter, can you address the issue of money value? Do you think there are better methods of attaching and interfering values of the materials and services we use? I am going to do no less than attach one more question. Whatever you respond with to these questions, please bear in mind that we're asking, how can we then, practices that you're highlighting, how can we uh, activate, accelerate, and scale out those practices and strategies for global social transformation? Peter, please, and we'll take the round in the same order in which we presented. Sure, I'll be brief uh, in answer to your personal question. That's pretty much summarized in that graph that was shown on screen, which an enormous amount of effort and time and research behind it needs to be understood by folks from a structuralist perspective, because while I've listened to all of you speak so beautifully on so many subjects, <clears throat> and I agree with all of you, if unless you have, unless you recognize that the human being is an intermediate subject in the field of causality, we have a certain degree of free will, but we don't have a certain degree of free will. We have a certain moral aptitude that we can make you know, disciplined judgments, but due to pressures of society, particularly economic pressures, the very mechanism of survival, we are gonna be subordinated and we are gonna be compromised. And they're always gonna have the outliers that create crime, that create the whole spectrum of disorder and aberrant behavior that we see. So my core thesis, and this goes to the question of politicians, politicians are just, as, just like us, a product of the society and the culture. And unfortunately, the politicians are even more entrenched because in modern government today, it is a business government to one degree or another. That is the structural reality of how government even materialized. If you didn't have this kind of economy, we wouldn't have the kind of a government system that we do. So everything that I say and point to moves away from everything related to market dynamics. I can't emphasize that enough. We can talk about money being needed or invented. The truth is it's an exchange of ideas. It's a market of ideas. You don't need currency when you really look at the state of efficiency that we're capable of and you really start to break down the distorted values that have been created for literally 100 years, uh, if not long before that. But really the, the Industrial Revolution is what has set in motion the sickness of our lack of sustainability and the cultural pollution that has completely distorted our social psychology. So until those massive moves are pushed into, I say massive, but we can do it in a step-by-step -step manner, access, property, localization, they're already happening to a certain degree. But that is the force. We can hypothesize about how our minds can evolve within this system, which they can, as with the beautiful people I'm speaking with right now. You are all products of the system as I am, but you have elevated yourselves to see beyond the causticness of normality as it exists. But that's few and far between. So if you want to get the vast majority of people to start behaving in a way that's actually sustainable and is actually uh, in support of humane social practices, ending violence, inequality, all those caustic things, it's going to take a massive structural shift. So I hope that answers your question. And I think I answered the other question that was there. He also mentioned a natural law resource-based economy, Christopher Mazzara. And as far as the transition to that, that is exactly what I'm saying in terms of those five points uh, I denoted in that graph. 
Margaret, please, you already gave us steps. Could you please add more to, to these questions and your comments? I'll just keep it very straightforward and very simple. I think that we have a lot of people trying to make a big difference in all sorts of places around the world at the moment. And I think we have some of those within structures, like we have NGOs everywhere. We have Paolo Freire Institutes. And I think making that link between local conscientization and the more collective move towards global movements um, could be more accessible if we tap into both of those. I think people are already using these techniques. What I identified is that missing link that takes us from local to global. So I'll just step on one side. So many ideas for people to grasp. Gita, I've said in a previous panel, trying to bind Joseph and Margaret and Lee to you, I've said in a previous panel, it seems that we're not lacking knowledge. We are experiencing loss of knowledge when there's lack of collaboration. So please. Uh, yes, um, if I may, uh, first I want to answer the question from Rodolfo Fiorini. Uh, today, concept clarity is fundamental. For instance, when people say we need system thinking, they use a very ambiguous sentence. Do you agree? Uh, do you see this? Mila? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, yes, uh, uh, that is very, uh, that is an important question. Today, um, many system thinkers answer to global problems with, it is more complex. Um, that is correct, but it's, it's uh, not enough. Um, in my opinion, we need to uh, learn to specify, to learn to uh, think more clearly and to address the problems directly. And the most important thing to me is, um, as uh, Peter and Margaret um, also uh, put out in uh, their concepts and ideas, um, the individual. A strong individual that can think for him or herself. I think that's a, a very important answer to many, many questions we have today. We work with uh, people from India, from a foundation who is helping children there to get a better education. Um, oh. And we have some uh, projects here in Germany, school and education projects, and it's, uh, it's everywhere the same thing. Um, children with um, wonderful uh, capabilities and really, really strong impulses to learn are trained to do, unlearn to uh, think for themselves. I, I think that is the most important thing here from my perspective. Um, uh, even the more with uh, capitalism rising in uh, third world countries and um, uh, I do not, do not know the English concept, um, where um, we in Germany and the Western culture finally learn that we have to uh, unlearn what we've learned <laughs> and to think in another way. We see in other countries capitalism rising. Yeah, and that's a, that's a problem we are facing also. And I think uh, the best idea is to um, um, think more globally also in the way we want to uh, uh, find solutions, which means to me, uh, help the individual to do it uh, for him or herself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gita. And uh, Jerry, would you like to just add, add to this quickly as we are running over time, but the actually we're only now I think warmed I'm just up. Gonna slide. I'll just, I'll just sum it up with the final slide, yeah. Yes, Jerry, if you don't mind, if you have a couple of notes. No, uh, uh, <laughs> no, it, it's too many things to say. I can't put it in a sentence. I'm just not good enough other than, uh, as the extraterrestrial <laughs> said, be it. good. <laughs> you know? Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, Thank all you. right. So I just wanted to sum this up. I think this is a, a, a conclusion to what we're talking about. We're talking about language, you're talking about the relation of people to structures, how to change those, how to catalyze change. And I see it as a series of gears that are interconnected, right? So uh, the first one is the culture method, right? That has been left out of this developmental thing that have this generative knowledge, this, the um, engaging um, field work methods and qualitative data, but most importantly, the culture-based methods that enable this critical thinking that enable these inter-reflections and that enable this learn ownership of learning experience that is the most empower empowering thing. 
And then the third gear is re-architecting our systems for change. And this socio-systemic thing goes together because the problem with broad-based structural change is that if you don't have people to understand that new structure or don't understand how to use it or engage with it, it doesn't work. And, and so this, the culture methods and the structural change actually really do go together. So re-architecting new systems, this is very much what, what Peter Joseph put forward in his uh, five points. It also has to do with, I, I listed a couple of key innovations, but the key thing is changing systemic incentives new metrics and new information flows. A different type of information becomes dominant. Acting on some leverage points and system acupuncture points, right? So systemic in innovations that act on a system leverage point that have the capacity to change that system. And the transformative leadership I put in the middle of those two, because a transformative leader needs the skills of understanding how to act structurally and systemically and how to work with communities, generative knowledge, and cultivating sustainable cultures. And the third wheel, um, sorry, the fourth wheel, the integral acceleration. Um, this is really important in terms of the, what Peter is doing with these interreflections, the actual affordance that enables one system to go to another is the ability for these interconnections to be made. That's the coherence capacity that enables the shift. Um, so the integral acceleration is, for example, collaboration literacy and structural literacy. Collaboration literacy is a program that teaches people how to collaborate in practice, not to say, I have partners, I have partners. Warm data is an integral accelerator because warm data is all about the connection between different structures in society and, and personal experience. Weavers, people that cultivators, catalysts, new storytellers. So creating these new capacities, the interreflective capacity, the capacity for structural awareness and action, generative cultural capacity means your individual practice. This is not just sitting in an arm desk issuing orders. Integral human capacities, how we actually change as beings in the process. And I think these are the wheels that are this process of key transformative change. It's by no means exhaustive, but I think these are the key things that we are talking about in these um, socio-systemic framework for catalyzing transformation. And the last one I put was North Star. So the North Star is just the vision point that, bring, that brings these people like us all, all, to, all together. Um, so I think, I hope that sort of round things off and answers some of the questions that the, that the audience um, has. I think it sort of brings together the key things that we spoke about, um, that these are the methods that have been left out of, you know, achieving the sustainable development goals, of what genuine social progress looks like is a completely different architecture that is both an inner architecture for, for our values and for ourselves, as well as a real systemic architecture for changing our systems for genuine social progress. And I want to thank everybody for their contribution. I yeah. know we had to cram things in a lot in to a small time. I really appreciate everyone doing that. I appreciate um, your time and especially everyone having the patience to go a little overboard. Um, but I think with these breakthroughs in thinking, these tactics, these strategies, these practices, um, I think we have a real chance for change. And my God, are we at a crossroads where we need it. So thank you for these amazing souls thank for coming Julie. forward and, um, and making this contribution. Thank you. Questions are pouring in and more comments are pouring in. Um, I am just going to be very conscious of all the people that are supporting us right now uh, in a completely different time zone, uh, endlessly patient and brilliant and supportive that are providing this platform for us uh, uh, from the unseen so that we can show up. And uh, to highlight a couple of questions that came in for me and for Gita and for all, uh, the question about coding, what is the way to code this? forward and what is the way a question to me was to get people to open up you have to relate 
to their reality. You have to apply empathy to recognize the collectivity from within and all the intersectionality of identities from within yourself in order to become that finer medium, in order to reach out and invite them to be more of themselves. I'm probably going to leave you with the question that we're all addressing today, but what would be the fastest, most efficient way to generate the new meme uh, new cultural meme to spread it as fast as possible that is as powerful as money, that is as powerful as language that we're using and, and that is emotionally uh, empowered, spread that fast. I guess that's, I'm rephrasing your question and giving it over to, to the panel just for some future collaboration and discussion. And the meme that is not going to require human sacrifice, like the sacrifice that we have seen in the US and the death of, of, of a man and multiple people from African American community. It's a human sacrifice for us to be able to show and in the public space together. But what I'm saying is we go beyond just money meme that we know. So I am excited for this. Please understand this is just an invitation to collaborate to work together in the arts culture and humanities working group of the um, Global Leadership in the 21st Century Project. Uh, all we have is just an opportunity to meet like this, exchange and, and share a slice of life together. But my invitation is for you to continue listening to this because all of this is recorded. We will have all the questions and comments uh, saved and we will be able to continue uh, on to the next project, uh, sec part of the project, and the next meeting we're expecting to be in Geneva. We're hoping it to, that it'll be at least in part in person, hybrid version, but do know that this is just a pathway, and I'm not sure how we are doing even in the project on really converging these ideas, but it's certainly we're opening a pathway for an unprecedented exercise in self-reflection. This is the first time that we have invited entire humanity, uh, uh, humanity to self-reflect together. You have my appreciation for your patience, for your sharing of energy and personal stories and for showing up. Um, my warm embrace uh, for all of you, let us show up in public places together as colleagues, as friends, as uh, planetary beings. My best to all and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Let's stay in touch. Thanks. Thank you.